Hello and welcome to the very first episode of Rails to Nowhere. My name's Simon and I am a student of railway history at the University of York, a lifelong railway enthusiast and an occasional train driver. And joining me today is my fantastic co-host Ella. Hello, I'm Ella. I am a student at a university in London of history, uh, a rail enthusiast and also occasional podcaster. Welcome to our first episode. The first thing I want to do is start off with who are we? What is Rails to Nowhere? Why are we here? We are here to talk about history of the railways and a little bit of travel more generally. We are mostly looking at Britain. That doesn't mean we're not looking at stuff outside of Britain. We both have some interests beyond the shores of the British Isles. I know I have at least two episodes in the pipe work. Um, for a foreign subject. Yeah, and I have at least one. Um, yeah. it, it's just what we have access to over here because we're not, as well, that's our next point, we're not just going to be focusing on the well-known stuff. and Instead, yes. we're going to be spending a lot of time digging through archives and other similar resources. Yes, this episode is a little bit of a more well-known topic. But the bonus episode that we recorded a couple of days ago looks at a little bit more of a less known aspect of this topic. Yes. So we're not just focusing on well-known stuff and we're hoping to dig into more lesser known things. So while today's episode and next month's episode will be focusing on things that are relatively well known on the surface, we're hoping to dig a little deeper under the surface to find some more interesting and potentially unknown things about it. And if you have a chance to look at the bonus episode, which for this month will be free, you, you will see what we mean by we're digging in deep because we'll be focusing on a, one individual character from this entire story. So yes, having said all of that, today's main topic is the Railway Act 1921, which I've picked a nice, big, bold scary topic for our first episode, mainly because this month, August, is the 100th anniversary of the bill getting royal assent. So I thought it was a nice topical subject for us to talk about in our first episode. Mm, yes, and I think for those who do not know what the Railway Act is, it's probably one of the most significant bits of legislation related to the British Rail Network for its entire history, I would say. Yes, so the Railway Act is one of the two really big pieces of legislation to do with the railways in the period from the end of the First World War through to nationalisation. There's really two major bits of legislation in that. You've got the Railway Act in 1921, and then you have the London Passenger Transport Act in 1933. Three, I think it is. And these two acts are really how government sort of experiments with different ways of amalgamating the railways and bringing them under government control. Mm. So what's the high level summary of the Railway Act? At its core, it brings most of the 120 odd rail companies that were operating trains or railways in Britain in 1921 and it brings them together into four regional companies. Um, so you get the Great Western, the London Midland and Scottish, the London Northeastern and the Southern Railways formed, each operating over a fairly broad geographic area. The Southern mm. Railway is the most restricted but the other three are quite large areas and it's really a step up in state intervention and state control over the railways and is really the big first step towards the path of nationalisation in 1948. Yes and it's important to note that while these are mostly geographically constrained there are many cases of other railways straying into others territory because of what the service requirements were there were most certainly examples of Great Western straining into the Southern and the LMS territory. LNER and LMS were constantly just, you know, wiggling over each other's territory because that's just how it was. 
The big examples are obviously the two routes down to the southwest for mm. the South mm. Southern and Great Western Railway. Quite famously, you end up with that bit down in sort of Cornwall, Devon, where the Southern Railway switches to being north of the Great Western Railway. Mm. And you have the other big example of everything from the Great Central Railway that goes to the LNER, but that leaves the LNER with a main line running through the Midlands, which interacts massively with the London, Midland and Scottish's Midland main line. And you end up with the Midland coming all the way across to Essex. It's quite messy. That just comes out of how the British network was built. It was a lot of individuals kind of throwing down a line here and going, mm, sounds good. And there wasn't ever a cohesive plan to actually build something that was a network rather than just individual companies going, I will run something from A to B. Yeah. After the Railway Act comes in, there's an estimate that around 50% of the network is still exposed to competing companies. And of the 84 towns, over 80,000 people after the Act, 50 of them were still served by more than one company rather than the 64 before. So there's still a lot of competition and overlapping territory. Yes. We should probably explain how such an idea to take all these little companies and create four huge ones from them started, I think. Yes, so let's have a look at the background to rail travel in Britain before the First World War. Mm. The railways in Britain were built as many small independent companies. Mm. The result of this is you have a complex mesh of 120-ish rail companies by 1914. Mm. Many with small scopes, some with big scope. Some, like the Great Western Railway, run huge tracts of railway. Some are just dedicated to a small branch line. There was a lot of localised companies. So you end up with a lot of conflicting interests and a lot of local interests causing the network to become quite messy, quite disorganised and uncoordinated. So, very early on in the history of the railways, you end up with attempts to try and coordinate operations of the railways. Some of these take the form of voluntary industry organisations. So you've probably heard of the Railway Clearinghouse, which was responsible for allocating the amount of money from a ticket purchase that went to the different companies when someone bought a ticket that took them across different companies' routes. That was a industry body. It was set up by the railway companies and was a sort of voluntary coordination between the two. There is a good chance you've seen one of their maps. If you are a reader of the Wikipedia, their maps show up quite often because they're actually really good. Yeah, they made wonderful detailed maps of all the different railways. Very, very early on in the 1840s, you see the government begin to step in to start regulating the railways. So you see a number of things. You've got requirements for the Board of Trade to inspect new lines before they can be opened to the public. You have Her Majesty's Railway Inspectorate, which inspects for accidents and incidents and is the parental organization so to speak of the rail accident and investigation branches that we have today mm. that's formed as early as 1840 to investigate safety issues and and incidents some of the earliest standards for construction and production of materials are for the railways you also have regulation over rates that the companies can charge mm. so there's coordination over goods and passenger charges and also things like covered carriages for, th for third class yes so we're seeing efforts to coordinate the railways from a government and an industry point of view as early as the 1840s and this means that even by the 1880s we're seeing regular discussion in Parliament about whether the railways should be brought under state control. Mm. And the reason for this coordination is because you start, people started to observe this phenomenon called emergent behaviour, which is as you get multiple systems that all interact with each other, behaviours start to emerge from them. So people would want to travel, say, from London to... Bath or, or London to Bristol on the Great Western and then change to one of the 
small mining railways that then happen to run a passenger train to yes. get into somewhere like Ammanford. That's the thing, is like even running passenger trains is emergent behaviour for mm. the railways. The, the Liverpool and Manchester, the famous first intercity rail service in the UK, or even the world, did not expect that passengers would want to travel on its trains. It, mm. The managers of the Liverpool and Manchester found it initially baffling that people wanted to travel on their trains. And very quickly, as the network starts to form together, this idea that actually they're just going to be little point-to-point -point services. The railways will serve a market from Liverpool to Manchester, but it's not part of a wider net eventually you start to find that actually, oh, people are coming from Chester and changing at Manchester and then going on to Liverpool. Well, this was not what we expected to happen. Mm. So you start seeing a network emerge. And as that happens, you start seeing pushes to make that into a coordinated network. Mm. And so debate rages through the 1800s about what should that look like? Mm. You have people like Gladstone, who argue that the railways are a natural monopoly and that therefore they should be brought into the state's remit and work for the good of the nation, just like the post office. Gladstone mm. sees the railways as being analogous to the post office. It's natural that there is a single monopoly on this service. It's the way you get the best efficiency and the best service to the nation, and therefore it should come under the guise of the state so that it can work in the best interests of the people. However... This doesn't take hold in the 1800s you end up instead with a system of gradual amalgamations so you start seeing companies like the great western the london brighton south coast all sort of starting to absorb the smaller companies around them and form them into ever increasingly large companies Mm. Obviously, it's a complex picture and different companies have different ways that they're doing the amalgamations and there's no one size fits all option. And you're seeing people questioning why in locations where the rail companies meet, do you need two or even three of the same facility next to each other? Why could these not mm. be amalgamated into one? A classic example of this, of course, is at Leamington Spa where the Great Western and London and North Western railway stations were right next door to each other. But there are hundreds of examples of this across the country, of stations next to each other, goods sheds next to each other, other facilities mimicking what the other is doing. And there's this sense that this is wasteful and inefficient, because you've got two companies performing the same task. Of course, against this, you've got those who are against nationalisation, Maybe pro-amalgamation, because that's a natural activity of private enterprises that eventually they amalgamate into increasingly large organisations because that does gain you efficiencies. But you get arguments against nationalisation. There are concerns that a state monopoly wouldn't have an incentive to invest or improve because it would just have a blank cheque from the state. There are concerns that a state organisation would not have any interest in actually serving the customer as the customer wants to be served because, again, they would have a blank cheque from the government and so there's no reason to earn the customer's loyalty. There's also concerns about the possibility of corruption because there's the possibility that if the state's running the railway you might find self-interested parties within government using the regulatory power of government to gain something out of the railways. And all of these are valid debates to be having. These are all very familiar to people who've watched the debates over the privatisation of the railways in the 90s and mm. the current debates surrounding the future of the railways. The big one that always comes up is the competition one. And there's probably yes. a very interesting debate to be had over competition then and now. Yes. And of course, there's the big debate about whether competition is within transport modes or between transport modes as well. Mm. Is competition between railway companies or is it between the railways and the canals and the roads? Mm. Which we will cover a little bit more in the later part of this episode. We're going to look at where competition starts to hurt the railways. So we then end up with World War One, And World War One is often seen as a turning point for the railways for a number of reasons. The war triggered a shift in attitude towards the railways. First of all, during the First World War, we see the formation of the Railway Executive Committee, which is a committee formed by the government to take 
strategic control of the railways. They are still private organisations, they're still private enterprises, and the government is paying them a set fee to run their services. So it's guaranteeing profits, a very similar arrangement to what we've seen over the last year or so with the coronavirus pandemic. Mm, the emergency relief funding which yeah. essentially is we will pay you and you will be making some money but not much just enough yeah. to cover your costs in the first world war it's a little bit more than some money not much mm. it's not masses of money but mm. it's quite a comfortable period for the rail mm. companies but it's this idea that there's a greater national need and national emergency and therefore the government takes some level of control away from the railways mm. And this is where we start to see the railways seen as not only just a network for moving things, but as a strategic thing as well. Yes. Rather than just being a thing for civilian use, it's also seen as potentially a thing for national security because, well, the ability to shift troops and munitions very quickly is very helpful in a time of war. Yes. And so, as well as paying the money to the railway companies in order to guarantee their income during the time of national emergency, the government takes strategic control of the railways. It forms the National Executive Committee and it starts actually running the railways itself. Mm. And we start to see people within government really start to appreciate the importance and usefulness of a coordinated network mm. and start to see and understand some of the real problems that the way the rail system has developed grow up to that coordinated system. Mm. No, we don't have things like break of gauge anymore, but you still have obstructions to through running. Networks don't necessarily connect physically. The stations mm. are in slightly different locations. You've got a transship between goods yards and goods sheds. Mm. And you can see things like you'll have a two railways next to each other a 90 degree and no curve between them. We also end up with the First World War leading to the appearance within government of one of the deputy general managers of the North Eastern Railway, who we will talk a bit more about in the bonus episode. But this is where mm. we find a character called Eric Getz, who during the First World War is appointed into the government by Lloyd George, who is seeking business people to work within government to bring their expertise in, and Geds is appointed to run various roles within the Ministry of Munitions and the Ministry of War, but eventually ends up as head of military railways in France and head of military transportation, and ends up in charge of all of the modes of transport within France from about 1917 onwards, just after the Battle of the Somme. And he is a very interesting character. As we say, you should listen to the bonus episode, but to give an idea of what this man is responsible for, he took a gridlocked, uncoordinated military network and managed to convert it into something that actually was able to deliver the required amount of munitions to the front. Yes. Because the issues of munitions at the Somme were not really that we couldn't make munitions. It was more that it was impossible to get the munitions to the front because of gridlock. Yes. And at this point, the biggest competition to rail in terms of bulk goods transit would be the canals and the shipping. Yes. So Geds comes out of the First World War with a attitude that a unified and connected rail system and transport system is the ideal aim. Mm. He's not in favour of nationalisation. He is one of the big people that fears that state control might lead to poor service for the customers and the potential for corruption. Mm. And by customers, we're talking about everyone from passengers to the freight people. Exactly. We're talking about anyone who is paying mm. a rail company to do something yeah. for them. Or a transport company, because he mm. is strongly in favour of a coordinated system of transport. Mm. In fact, he proposes to create a mega department within the government. Mm. So Lloyd George, after the war, becomes Prime Minister, and wants to form a new department for transportation. And Geds is tasked with creating this department. And so he proposes the creation of the Ministry of Transport, which will have enormous wide sweeping powers. It will mm. be responsible for rail, road, canals, maritime transport, take over the docks. It will take over electricity. 
Mm. It will take over power generation. It will take over huge amounts of of the infrastructure for the country, it would become the largest, the most expensive department that has ever existed and will ever exist within the British government. And the Ministry of Transport is proposed to have the power to nationalise all these forms of transport if it wants to. Geds believes that leaving them in private hands but with government control and government coordination is the best solution, but the Ministry of Transport is to have the power to nationalise all of these forms of transport Mm. if it wants to. However, the Ministry of Transport receives significant pushback as proposed by Geds. The prevailing attitude following the First World War from the public and parliament is that while strong autocratic government was fine for the duration of the war now we want to go back to our nice liberal british democracy we want to go back to a time when the state was more laissez-faire and was less interventionist Mm. and an enormous department taking autocratic control over massive amounts of free enterprise is seen as an extraordinary assault on parliamentary sovereignty. The powers that would be invested in the Minister of Transport are seen as autocratic and dictatorial in scope, and there are many within Parliament who do not like the idea of creating such an all-encompassing department. Mm. As a department, to give an idea of the scale, it would be possibly the most powerful minister besides the prime minister within the Commons chamber. Yeah, exactly. And they would have almost as much control as a prime minister would just because of how much the MOT would touch. Exactly. This was seen as an affront by many in Parliament. You also end up with the inevitable departmental jealousy. The Department of Trade, who are responsible for electricity and ports, don't want to see those taken away from them. You end up with concerns from the Secretary of State for Scotland that the Glasgow Corporation is going to hit the roof if we're going to take the buses and trams off of them. So very quickly you end up with the Cabinet stripping out the responsibilities for air and maritime transport, The power for control over trams and buses is very quickly ripped out. And eventually, the power to nationalise transport forms is taken out of the legislation to create the Ministry of Transport. So you basically end up with the Ministry of Transport being formed as a rump organisation with limited control over roads and some authority over the railways and Geds's proposed integrated transport system is left in tatters on the floor however however so this is all in 1919 that the ministry of transport is proposed the legislation is passed eventually in 1920 the ministry of transport comes into force and so Geds is now appointed minister of transport is the first minister of transport and In that post, he proposes some new legislation to bring forward the Railway Act 1921. And this legislation is designed to attempt to create the bit of an integrated transport system that Geds now has the power to try and achieve. And that is to create a more integrated rail system. It's very much a middle road legislation when you consider what Geds wants to do. Yes. So the initial proposal is for between seven and nine regions. The proposal is for five English groups, a southern, western, northwestern, eastern and northeastern, a London group for passengers, and then there would be separate groups for Scotland and Ireland. And Ireland was at this point still just under British control. At this point, the Irish War of Independence has been going on for about a year, and Mm. the Irish War of Independence is basically coming to a close. But yes, this legislation is being proposed, assuming that um, the British government might retain control over the whole of Ireland. The Act is obviously slightly amended, and you end up with just four rail companies being formed. There's no London passenger group. That's something that's left for a later date. And the decision was taken to integrate the Scottish group into four English groups so that you would end up with a single train up company operating the Anglo-Scottish routes. 
So as we discussed earlier, this brings a complex situation because the grouping does not work neatly. In fact, there's huge amounts of work that go into working out which routes are going to be operated by what companies. And as we discussed earlier, there's still enormous overlap between the different rail companies. Mm. But you end up with the four companies, the Great Western, the London Northeastern, the London Midland and Scottish, and the Southern Railways being formed. The only one of those that remained with its existing name was the Great Western Railway, which had already operated huge amounts of trackage within its area and managed to successfully lobby the government to allow it to retain its existing identity. The other three companies are formed out of either many, many, many companies like the London Midland and Scottish and the London Northeastern are, or out of a smaller number of companies like the Southern Railway is. Yes, and what's quite interesting about this is you can see the effects of this amalgamation of varying different sizes of companies and operations when it comes down to what the companies actually ended up being able to do and what they ended up yes. with. I would like to just like quickly be a bit of a nerd and talk about kettles for a moment. The Great Western mostly were able to have a standardised or relatively standardised fleet. But then you look at someone like the London Midland and Scottish Railway with Stania and he's dealing with hundreds of different patterns of locomotive, all of varying size, but nothing of particularly good long distance things, which is then how you end up with great big programs like the uh, creation of the coronation class as a solution yes. to this problem while on the southern railway you end up with like, all these little tank engines and then some okay but not amazing express passengers apart from like a few exceptions but and it's just because yeah. of how varied the operations were of the companies that end up forming them yes you end up with huge disparity in as you say in the scale and size of the companies for example, the London Midland Scottish controls 60% of the railway network after grouping, which makes it an enormous company compared to the rest, because this one company is controlling 60% of the network, and the remaining 40% of the rail network is controlled by the other three companies combined. So the LMS ends up being quite a wealthy company to a degree because it's big. The Great Western is reasonably wealthy because it's got resources like the Welsh coal mines. And so you end up with huge disparity in the finances and abilities of the companies. The London Northeastern Railway is widely considered to be the poor child of the Railway Act. Which is funny, considering the notoriety they end up with. Yes, they have crack expresses like the Flying Scotsman and the A4s and the A3s. But day to day, the London Northeastern is poor. It has things like the Northeastern coal fields in its territory, but it also just covers tracts and tracts and tracts of nothing. Mm. It runs the trains in Lincolnshire, it runs the trains in Suffolk and Norfolk and East mm. and the rest of East Anglia. It runs trains to small villages mm. across tracks and tracks and tracks of nothing. It is mm. the or relation to the other three. By contrast, you end up with the Southern Railway with a hugely dense urban and suburban rail system, which it starts heavily electrifying to mm. bring in more commuters to get more money out of them. It is massively dependent on commuter traffic. It's also interesting so you bring up the electrification because you end up with this very interesting divergence in the innovations each company goes to make, with obviously the Southern Railway pursuing the electrification, which we now have... Yep decided as a country is generally a good idea if you are interested in that go and look up the contraction decarbonization plan and then you get other countries like the london northeastern who basically just put most of their top engineers on building the best crack express locomotive they can because their line compared to the west coast main line covers all of about four principal population bases and yes. there's miles and miles between them so it makes sense to develop a locomotive that can average 80 90 miles an hour for long exactly. long periods and can hit hit these record breaking speeds of 120 odd miles an hour exactly and the LNER invest in a little bit of electrification. There's some electrification mm. out of Liverpool Street. The LNER runs the Woodhead route, so that famous electrification mm. is theirs. 
Well, then the LMS do some as well. The LMS has some electrification, but they run trains to Manchester, Birmingham, Liverpool, Glasgow, all of these big industrial cities. But the problem that all four of them face presents itself in slightly different ways for each of them. They're going to be a little bit generalistic here, but it presents itself in similar ways, but there are slight nuances for each of them. The problem they all face is that they're not prepared for the world after the First World War, and they're not prepared for a couple of key events. The first is that the end of the First World War results in lots and lots of people coming out of the war able to drive. Mm. You also end up with the military needing to shed lots and lots of small goods vehicles for not very much money. Mm. So you end up with a massive influx in road vehicles coming out of the war. And you end up going from around 41,000 motor goods vehicles on Britain's roads in 1914 to 100,000 in 1920. And by 1938, we're talking 500,000 motor vehicles. And while these are not very big vehicles and they're quite slow and the roads are generally not very good, critically, they're the perfect size for a single person or maybe a pair of people to load and unload, and thus run a small haulage firm with. Additionally, they offer a couple of key advantages to the customer that allows them to very quickly begin to eat into the rail company's profits. The first is that road transport is completely and utterly deregulated. So the rail companies are tied to their rates of carriage by government, which sets fair rates for the railways to charge. So what a lot of the owners of the, sing of the lorries do is they go to the railway station, they look at the costs that have to be posted, and then they'll quote you just below that. Mm. And if you're not shipping much and it can fit in the back of a two-ton lorry, why pay for the railway to ship it? Exactly. And of course, you've got to get it to the train station. Mm. Whereas if I've got my little lorry, I can come to your place, pick your stuff up, and I can take it straight to wherever it's going. So the rail companies prove themselves to be unprepared for this. Mm. And there's quite a lot of complacency from the big four and the government about how road transport's going to grow. Because initially there's this sense that it's just going to be local deliveries just from customers close together, the sort of markets the railways are not dealing with. Mm. But it very quickly begins to grow into the sort of areas where the railways are operating, especially as road vehicles begin to become able to carry more stuff, they become faster, and the government begins investing in the quality of the roads. So you end up with a shift in goods transport away from the rail companies. You also begin to end up in a shift of suburban and commuter passengers away from the railways and onto motor buses. And there's actually even increasing numbers of intercity and longer distance coaches beginning to emerge mm. at this point and people beginning to move to road that way. Mm. And, of course, they can also compete there on price. And while you may not have as nice of a seat, even today, on a coach, the coach generally is much cheaper than the railways. You, yes. Back then and now. And you also see another well-known occurrence in this era, which is the Ford Model T. Mm. And you begin to see private road transport begin to take off initially as a luxury activity, but very quickly it begins to become a more mundane activity. And if you look at suburban developments of housing in the period from 1920 through to 1938, you can really see the growth of private motor cars in the way suburban developments are built. Because this is the period where we begin to move away from rows and rows of terraced houses to your classic 1920s house with a garden and a garage. So at this point, you begin to see the emergence of estates of semi-detached houses where it was expected and advertised that you would have a garage for your motor vehicle. This was done even by the railway companies that were serving or even building these estates, such as the Metropolitan Railway, which I think goes to show how much the rail companies didn't expect that the motor car was going to impinge on their own businesses. This is the change that we're beginning to see. You can see it physically built into the built environment, these changes, and you can look mm. at estates built just before and just after the First World War and they're sort of your classic Victorian, Edwardian terraced houses. 
but by the early 1920s and certainly by the end of the 1930s you're looking at much more car orientated estates mm. and no the motor car does not have the dominance in the 1930s that it does today but you're seeing how it's beginning to take hold and beginning to become a thing that's not just a thing that rich people have mm. i live in a classic terrace house in london even round here when these were built just after the war really around 1920s 1930s and most of these still have the original alleyway with the garage on it mm. And you also see the shift in how motor transport is being utilised and who it's being utilised by within the advertising the railways are putting out. So initially, to react against motor transport, you're seeing the railways advertising the luxury and comfort of mm. their services. This is where the coronation, the five bell sets and all that sort of thing comes from. This idea of luxury and beauty. Yes, it's initially trying to lure the well-to-do customers back to the network. But mm. very quickly, it begins to shift to highlighting how, for the general commuter, for the normal passenger, the railways are better. Indeed, this is one of the reasons why the Southern Railway electrified its lines so aggressively. It wanted to try and lure people away from the car by advertising that, firstly, its services were clean and modern, and secondly, that they were, in fact, the modern technological marvel and not the motor car. It's saying, look, we're trying to recapture the excitement and novelty mm. of the innovation of the past and bring it to today. And as you say, that's what the coronations and the A4s were aiming for. The streamlining on the coronations and the A4s is there to make them look modern mm. and exciting and something new. And it's all about conveying speed because... Mm. The railways have to convey that their part of the journey is going to be nice and quick and get you where you're going mm. quickly to try and compete with this idea that actually just going door to door on your motor car is the fastest way of doing mm. it. And we even see this with some of the film adverts put out. I don't know if you've seen the V1 where you have a coronation steaming up the West Coast followed by a biplane and the biplane is there being outpaced by the steam locomotive. And we see this in other countries too. We see this in America. The Pennsylvania Railroad famously puts a lot of work into streamlining its locomotives and producing very good-looking locomotives as a result. Interestingly, though, speeds actually didn't improve. Mm. On the Southern and the Great Western, they got a little quicker. Electrification on the Southern Railway allowed journeys to get a bit quicker because electric trains accelerate better. The Great Western's average speed went up slightly because some of their crack expresses got noticeably faster. The LNER and the LMS got slower. Mm. And that meant that by 1938, on average, train journeys were taking as long as they were. And of course, the finances of the railways are hit by one other big event in this period, which is, of course, the Great Depression, mm. which drives a massive decline in bulk freight and goods traffic as well. And a lot of the financial base of the railways is based on bulk freight. And overall, that means that we're looking at a picture of the four companies struggling to retain their financial positions, some more so than others, but the picture is not good across the board. So we end up... Yes, with a slightly more coordinated system, but we still don't end up with a government coordinating the system to the degree that it had been envisaged. We end up with ministers of transport who are not so interested in the coordination of the railways. Geds ends up leaving the Ministry of Transport at the end of 1921. He finds that the infighting and politicking of government is not for him. He very much liked being a technocrat. In that respect, working as head of the railways in the First World War was something he excelled that because he could just be an autocratic technocrat. He ends up leaving the government in a bit of disgrace in the end because he is put in charge of the National Committee on Expenditure where he proposes enormous cuts to government expenditure. So Geds ends up leaving the government and going back into private industry and we end up with a variety of transport ministers who have varying attitudes towards the railways and gradually attitude starts to shift towards the roads. The roads are being improved, motor vehicles are becoming less regulated, they're becoming faster they're becoming heavier and they're driving around on better roads mm. and there are many reasons for this the road vehicle obviously represents a lot of personal freedoms it represents a lot of ability of one to kind of make their own way in the world exactly so what are my conclusions yes what are your conclusions on this act <laughs> 
The Railway Act was a significant milestone in the road towards nationalisation and the road towards a greater level of state control in transport. It was not the central control that Geds had hoped for. So the Ministry of Transport and the Railway Act try to achieve these things. They try to achieve a more coordinated and integrated transport system. But ultimately they reflect the learning points of someone who, during the First World War, was able to exercise military power um, and military coordination over their mm. integrated transport system on the trenches, running up headlong into parliamentary mm. democracy. And ultimately, Geds's attempts to create a national transport system were always going to fail because he was approaching them from a point of view of having been a military general mm. in the war, a post he'd been appointed to by Lloyd George during the war, who had had military authority to just make things happen, running up against a parliamentary system that didn't work that way. Mm. And was also made up of a lot of railway people within Parliament. And the big issues with the system the Railway Act resulted in was that the railways were quite inflexible in what they could do, but competition was not really between the railway companies. It was between the rail companies and other modes of transport. And while there were known forces in that regard, stuff like the canals and maritime transport were known and how they interacted with the railways, the roads and motor transport proved an unquantified force that the railways and the government were not ready or equipped to deal with. Mm. And the free-for-all and lack of centralised control in road transport allowed it to undermine the railways and begin to undermine their economics. Ultimately, things like the Great Depression had another big impact on the railways, but that's something you can't necessarily see coming. You maybe should know that there's going to be an economic depression at some point, but it's hard to prepare for such things. And the interesting thing is that the 1920s and 30s is what a lot of people think about when you mention the idea of the golden era of rail travel. The reality, as with many things, is a lot more complicated mm. than this narrative likes to paint. And there's many people that will argue that it was nationalisation in the 1940s that led to massive declines in passenger usage and freight mileage. But actually, you can see the trends starting in the 1920s. Many of the issues that British Rail would face, the stage was set in the 1920s and the 1930s. I'm sure we will at some point do several episodes on British Rail mm. and the challenges it faced. But I think a good place to start, especially now with current debates over ownership and government control of the railways and with debates over nationalisation versus privatisation, regional operators versus a national operator, debates over HS2 versus domestic flights versus road transport versus rail freight versus road freight, it's important to take a look at the first time that we really attempted to start coordinating transport. Understand where decisions were made, why it maybe went a little bit right, but why mostly it ended up quite not working out. Yeah. And I think the big learning point from the Railway Act and the Ministry of Transport is that actually competition is not necessarily between rail companies. It's between modes of transport and actually a efficient transport system is one that looks at all of its mm. systems and sees them collectively and working in unison rather than trying to compete between those modes. Mm. And that's my conclusions. That's what I draw from looking at the history of the Railway Act. They're broadly the same things that I would draw from this. And if anything, I would also say that we need to be careful in how we view this time because of the romanticisation of it. Yes. Because it's very easy to look at the posters put out by these companies. So some of the best ones, I think, came out the Southern Rail region mm -hmm. and go, oh, it was so much better back then. But then you think, but was it? You know, we're yes. dealing with in some cases services dropping to the absolute minimum you know a train a yeah. day at best uh, and you end up with some really 
in many ways, poor, short-sighted decisions being made because they're trying to attract customers back in ways that just don't work. Yes. Because you can put all this money into a beautiful streamlined express train, but if it doesn't go where the customer wants it to go, well, what's the point? Exactly. So hopefully we've given you some food for thought going away. We hope you've enjoyed our first episode. If you have or you haven't, then I'm sure you're more than welcome to let us know on the Twitters. Yep, we are at Rails to Nowhere. Yes, we also have a patron. If you have decided off the back of one episode that you love us enough that you want to help us make this, then... Um, patreon.com forward slash rails to nowhere yes none of this is particularly cheap to do um a lot of travel goes in went into this episode and a lot of travel will be going into the next episode as well yes simon very kindly went up to york and did some research for me and for this episode yes i will be visiting well i will have visited by the time this episode goes out probably the national archives uh, yep. For the next episode, I have been to various libraries within London, hu- hunting out rare books and unusual manuscripts and all sorts on a very particular lo- train. Actually, I, I should plug the next episode. The next episode will be on the advanced passenger train. I am looking at some of the more unusual technical sides of APT and the technical innovations that came about from that. Yes, so that's the next main episode coming out in a month from when this one goes live. Hopefully. (laughs) It should be the second week of August when this episode has gone live. Mm -hmm. It should be the second week of September when Ella's APT episode goes live. Mm -hmm. Between now and then, we've also got a bonus episode. Mm. Ordinarily, the bonus episodes will be a patron-only thing, but to help you get a better sense of the podcast and what you might get if you do subscribe as a patron we're releasing the first one to the general feed that's going to be on eric geds in more detail we're going to be looking at his career during the war and how that shaped his attitudes to the railways as we discussed today yep we'll also be discussing the idea of a more integrated transport network and how that may and how geds's ideas may be of use in the modern world because yep. it's very because um, that's kind of what we also want to think about is with this is how how the modern world can look at history to potentially improve itself because yes. if you don't look at history you are doomed to repeat it i think yes i think that's a fair thing to say so uh, that's all our plugs at rails to nowhere on the twitter patreon.com forward slash rails to nowhere Obviously, the podcast, as you are hopefully aware by now, is available on all podcast platforms that you might want, I hope. All quality podcast platforms. And YouTube, um, if you so wish to listen to a video with nothing actually moving on the screen. No actual video, (laughs) which I can understand, you know, maybe works for your podcast player. So thank you for listening, and we shall see you again next time. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.